All right. Well, again, welcome everybody to today's uh, NEETEC COVID-19 webinar series. Today we are discussing caring for COVID-19 labor and delivery patients. A couple of quick uh, housekeep housekeeping items to start with. For question and answer, we are going to um, spend a little time doing that with Dr. Horton at the end of this webinar. Please submit your questions in the Q&A function. Um, it's highlighted there at the bottom, on the bottom kind of right side of your screen. If you do have any technical difficulties or any questions on the, along those lines, please feel free to submit those in the chat. Um, so I am Sonia Bell. I'm the Assistant Director uh, for the Serious Communicable Diseases Program at Emory University and also one of the uh, Project Directors for the National, National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. And I will be your moderator today. Uh, so today, again, we are covering uh, COVID-19 uh, labor and delivery patients with Dr. John Horton. The topics to discuss will be the planning, screening, and testing of these patients, along with PPE, um, PPE protocols, and then also the medical course of these patients, antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum, and then the environmental considerations with visitors and cleaning. And then at the end, we will have a list of NETEC resources, and then also again, um, a Q&A session to answer some of the questions you submit in the chat function. All right, so time to get to the meat of things. So again, welcome from the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Um, our mission is to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. And how we do that, um, we have four kind of core functions, and that is um, assessment, education, technical assistance, and our research network. So we do um, help empower hospitals to gauge their readiness by using self-assessments and also on-site consultations. We provide self-paced education through online trainings and webinars such as this, also in-person courses. We have um, exercise templates avail available online, and we also have an online repository of tools and resources. And then our, um, also our special pathogen research network that helps to develop policies, procedures, and data capture tools to help facilitate research. And now I will hand you all over to Dr. John Horton, the Division Director of General ob at Emory Healthcare. And take it away, John, thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate it. So today, um, first I wanted to introduce myself. My name is John Patrick Horton. I've been with Emory for 12 years now and started the, with New Tech about six years ago, five, six years ago with the original, with the outbreak for Ebola and been with the partnership since helping develop the uh, protocols uh, for different pathogens and working with simulations uh, kind of across the US and different uh, different institutions and so it's an overall conglomeration of ideas and a tremendous amount of work goes into it for which I'm very thankful for NEETEC and their members. So I also want to give my disclaimers. My, I am an obstetrician and what that allows me to do is I'm on the floor a lot. I love labor and delivery and I'm around it a lot. Um, I am not a maternal fetal medicine doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist nor do I work um, specifically um, in infection prevention. Um, but what I do do well is I do protocols well, I do planning well, and I hope to put with this talk to be able to give you a framework of how to plan for this, but also create an overarching plan of how would we work on any emergency, especially those that are based in infectious disease. So I'll start off with, the, with that planning phase, and you are likely here, please know that we all are. The reason for that is, is because, as you know, the information changes not just by the day, but by the hour. And so one of our current challenges is how we take uh, the protocols and the information and the resources that are being given to us on an international and a national level and we pair and pare it down to fit in our tailored environment, our facilities, the places um, that we see patients. And one of the first things I want to address is how we, uh, the plan itself and what we have created. One of the most important plans that you can develop is overall a look at who do you have and what responses are they going to have. 
Namely, what are the fears going to be there? The fears of the staff, fears of patients, fears of visitors, and what we can do by creating plans for communication and resources for our providers, resources for the staff and our, our nursing, is it helps us through that fear response to be able to provide optimal and excellent patient care. The most important thing that you can do, in my mind, is creating an overall umbrella policy that will encompass multiple different categories, specifically in this case, an overall policy with disease. This overarching umbrella policy should have information on what you would do on your labor and delivery, women's health, postpartum, antepartum, and triage units, whether you had a droplet uh, concern for infectious disease that is droplet, whether it is airborne, whether it is a specific fluid borne, how would you respond to that? Well, how would you do, uh, handle the patient? What PPE would you use? And what would be your initial response? The benefit of having that umbrella policy, even now if you don't have one, is so that as the situation changes, you can take from that overall policy, that umbrella policy, and insert it into situ uh, specifics. In this case with COVID-19, Having our umbrella policy overall at our institution allowed for us to pull things out for droplet when we were concerned about our in sites where droplet is most concerned and then pull in the airborne disease can, uh, protocol for when we're having aerosolizing procedures with specific to COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. As you take that umbrella protocol, then you put, pare it down and you apply it to our specific area areas as well as provider type. Know that it is very likely, if not um, expected, that each uh, version uh, and place and the people involved will need their own specific um, addressing policies and procedures. So it brings us to the players and who are we talking about. First and foremost is our is nursing, um, our nurses as well as the nursing aides. The I cannot stress more how important it is to have the opinion and have the input of the people who will be in the room most. As you gather your list of people together who need to be there for any emergency, some of which are listed here, some of them are not. Think through everybody who is involved in the emergency, anybody who goes in and out of the room. And the first things you should do is create a communication call or email list. This is something in the future I would suggest that you look at monthly so that you know who to call within your emergencies in our women's health and or our labor delivery units. This will give you crucial time uh, back into knowing who, who needs to be there to help make decisions as quickly and concisely as possible. And you may even consider talking to a larger group about having specific subsets and cohorts or group to center on different areas within your women's health, um, women's health units. When you've got your umbrella plan and you've got the people involved, what I do want you to do is take your umbrella plan on a walk. Take the plan itself with a core group of people, of representatives, and walk through each one of your areas that any patient, any provider could walk through, could touch, could be a part of patient care or a part of where they would take a break. And look at that policy and how does that umbrella policy with the different types of contamination affect that area and affect the patient flow and patient type that goes into that area. For us, when we started talking about how we, how we manage this specific SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 outbreak, we first took a look at um, our space and we did have a plan of we would be using our antepartum unit as a cohorted area. We do have the benefit of having a large antepartum unit that is a bit away from and separated from our labor and delivery unit. And so our, our APU rooms are, we are blessed that they are large and we can set them up to be full labor and deliveries. And so for us, we were able to use an, an, our, an, part of our antepartum unit as a cohort area. And so we utilize that as patients come into triage. They are, uh, they are uh, we have a protocol, which we'll talk about in the, uh, later, about defining somebody as a person under investigation, and if they're a PUI, if they screen positive, then they are actually separate, they are put, put into that area for their full course, labor, 
delivery, recovery, and postpartum. Now, you may not have this ability. And one of the things that uh, we found very quickly when there were some of the initial uh, thoughts of there was a potential need for negative pressure rooms, though that we no longer are using negative pressure rooms um, for most of our positive patients. And one of the main reasons it is, on APU, we have one of them. On labor and delivery, our unit has two of them. And it's good to know where these are um, because we found that ours, our labor delivery is shaped like a square. And our negative pressure rooms are, of course, in two opposing corners. That was the easiest way to uh, create the engineering when our building was work, uh, when being processed. But take the knowledge from this event and put it into your plan that if in the future you have the ability to create a new and more a unique um, conversion area to cohort, then that is knowledge that will be worth it for down the line. Look at your space. Look at how it can be utilized. There, everyone's buildings will be different. I was originally trained at LSU, at LSU Charity, where we had wards, and so in some of some parts of our units. And in that case, you list one open room with lots of just curtains between patients. And so if I were staging that room, you take out two opposing beds and I create a physical barrier because it is incredibly important to have notification that if you have a cohort area, where that cohort area is and that you've prepped it to be um, uh, possible to go in and out of hot, warm, and cold zones. And so in a ward, you would have at least a physical space that you say, this is the line. You have your trash cans, your hand sanitizers, and your places to don and doff appropriately to go in and out of that space, even if it is an open space. We, did have, we do have a recommendation that for any patient that is found to be COVID positive after admission, that we are keeping those patients in the space they are in. As an example, if we get from triage to our labor and delivery, which currently is a cold zone for us, then as, uh, we would keep those patients in that, L in that LDR and it becomes their LDRP. We have a secondary plan that as labor and delivery fills up of how we would transport that patient and which, uh, which way we would take. And so the transport um, and the traffic patterns of how the patient and people flow will be incredibly important. Think about how people come in, in and out of your spaces, including the from the emergency room, from surgery, how does your anesthesia travel, and how would an EMS come in, come in and out of your space? Your best offense will be screening. There are lots of different options here. N nothing can be probably better in our mind than going through and asking something uh, about their symptomatology, but now also being a reminder that, now to that testing is becoming more widespread and the types and places that testing can occur is, can be outside a facility, that a part of that screening is simply asking if somebody has been tested positive, when they tested positive, or have they become in contact with someone who has tested positive. And it's great to have a screening tool, but the most important thing is how you relay any positives or negatives of that screening tool. We found we were initially challenged by um, how we communicate from our front door, and our front door to registration, and registration into the actual triage clinical space. And we're still working on that communication lines. And so having a clear point of how you flag a patient that has screened positive is incredibly important. Be very mindful of screening tools that may create um, a false sense of security. An example of that might be temperature screening, though it is, it is a tool, be mindful that even though someone may not have a fever, you know, that certainly that doesn't mean that they may not um, actually have the condition or that someone uh, that has a fever might have a different condition and have a reaction response to that as well. Everyone has to be asked and everyone has to be screened. And so that includes patients, visitors, and the next question is, is how are we, how are we watching our own personnel and our healthcare workers? And what are we doing to help educate ourselves on how we utilize and engineer our spaces to be safe when we're at work, even how we do appropriate cleaning and distancing of, of our spaces as best we can. This will bring us to uh, talk about uh, po positive COVID testing. One of the most uh, so biggest challenges that, of the last two weeks, um, certainly it's a significant part of media. Normally PPE is one of our uh, most discussed and controversial terms, but now testing has certainly become a, one of our biggest challenges. 
significant portion of how you test will be based off of resources and what kinds of tests you have, how many your facility can run, what are the testing supplies that you're needed, and especially how are you distributing uh, them across your hospital and your system, and who are you test, uh, testing. Uh, and a reminder that pregnancy may be considered a comorbidity. For many emergency rooms that are seeing and triaging patients, they may be testing even first trimester patients upon discharge if they appear to be well. And so knowing what your hospital is doing in its different sites will be incredibly important on how that potentially impacts labor and delivery. If you don't already know well your lab director, they should become quickly one of your best friends because they will be crucial for understanding what your current abilities um, are. This is one of the first times that as we're testing for a disease <clears throat> that the, the test itself may or may not have a significant change on your clinical management, especially as we consider the testing of asymptomatic patients. If we look to our history and we look and compare to testing of things like HIV and HSV, that allows us to enact therapies that decrease the, the morbidity into the neonate and certainly improves outcomes in mom. Same with syphilis being a non-viral uh, example of how we do testing ahead of time. <clears throat> and using that R, um, RPRs to give us an answer of what, what our testing and, and treatment should be, specifically with COVID-19, because the disease itself is transient, it may or may not have uh, significant symptoms. And though I will discuss some interventions that are important for the, uh, the symptomatic COVID positive patients, there is not significant clarity on how in, we change our clinical management for asymptomatic patients. The, there will be lots of, and there are a lot of great gu guidelines out there. There are best case scenarios that are being provided to us by ACOG, A1, AJOG, AGOG, and um, uh, even FIGO has a new article with uh, full descriptors. What I would say is go through these and then talk with your local providers on how you can translate that into your system. I would urge you as you look into testing that before you can uh, you make a testing plan go live that you consider all the ramifications of that uh, of a test positive in the different patient types because you may you will be soon choosing if you already haven't whether you're going to have targeted testing or you're going to be testing all our patients we are currently in our institution in this transition we are as of this coming week are we are testing all people under investigation. We're also, whether they're admitted or going home, and we have now developing enough, we have just now developed enough capacity to do testing and start testing on all uh, patients we were admitting to women's services that are pregnant. Now, as part of doing this, we sat down over this last, just this week, and said, we know we're gonna have an increase in number of po positives. And so how will that affect the players, the planning of the space and how will we react um, as our numbers go, go up just from finding asymptomatic patients. One of the things that will be incredibly important as the start is how do you run the test itself? Is it paperwork? Is it a computer? And who do you have in your information systems teams that make sure that you understand what tests you have and that you're being able to appropriately run the test you want to run. In our case, it is a rapid test that comes back in one to two hours versus a routine test. And then we made the decision that because of our routine test takes about 24 hours to come back, we are, we have, are fortunate to have the ability to run rapid testing on all patients who we think may deliver within that 24 hour period. And then who is doing the sampling? We made the decision with our IDIP teams that we actually have a swab squad. And so that does a couple of things. One, it allows us to focus expertise on how to do the testing. Um, and it also decreases our PPE use because you have one group of people who are utilizing re, uh, reusable PPE methods to be able to swab multiple patients and have an expertise in donning and doffing um, in our PUIs and then soon to be all of our patients. Now, as we go to testing all patients, we are not likely going to be able to utilize the swab squad for all asymptomatics. And so you, so if we created a protocol of who does that swabbing and being very mindful of 
making sure that everybody has the training for the appropriate PPE for the donning and doffing process. Get into the weeds on how those, uh, those samples are labeled and how they're handled. How does that sample go in and out of the room? How is it cleaned? How is the bag handled? Who takes it to the lab? All of these should be a part of your process, uh, process document. And so there is, an, again, an overarching um, umbrella, but then you get into the weeds, into the specifics. We should also note that if your testing is not being done in-house, consider if you're having to send your test out, is there a specific time by which those procedures, those tests need to leave the building? And knowing what that turnaround time is, in our cases, when we're doing a GYN side of things, where surgery, we know we have to have our preoperative samples at some of our facilities, those patients need to be there by um, before 11 a.m. to have testing done so they can be sent to a more a, a centralized lab that runs many of our rapid tests. Cons as you consideration who you're testing um, can, on considering the downstream effects. As you go to potentially testing both PUIs and or all patients, that is going to significantly change your PPE room, uh, your PPE needs. As we go to test all patients and or if you're testing your just your PUIs, what is your pediatric response? Are you choosing to co-room or are you separating the babies? We made the decision that we knew that as we made, uh, we go to choose to do testing for all of our patients uh, that are pregnant in the next week, that we know that we will be finding more patients that are positive than we have any ability to separate mom and baby our institution actually previously had already made the decision to co-room uh, the, the neonates and mom, moms who are healthy or asymptomatic. Of course, we do have um, a plan for which when patients are ill, that we have how we will isolate baby during that time. We have a breastfeeding policy uh, for moms who do want to breastfeed and how we do a risk-benefit conversa conversation with mom taking on using, uh, utilizing masking and cleaning of hands and breasts if they want to direct breastfeed, it is an option we are currently offering. If they choose to do pumping, then we have education and information on that, as well as if they, if they have a desire to separate from their neonate during that time. You definitely want to have a visitor plan. Our current plan is that we are allowing one, one visitor on our labor and delivery uh, for patients who are both um, asymptomatic and negative, as well as who are COVID positive. We, manage, we are managing those pregnancies and those visitors in room, utilizing um, as much, uh, keeping them into a similar space, into the same space as much as possible. Your facility may or may not allow that, and you may choose to ha not have visitors with your COVID positive patient. This is a big decision and the many hospitals have done that and I think each space and each uh, site needs to make that decision of what they think is best for them for their facility. Um, one of the things on testing that has become the newest and hottest topic is our, ho our hospital has come online with antibody testing. However, it should be uh, highlighted that at this time we don't know that antibodies um, actually convey immunity. And so our facility is mainly using antibody testing to help us understand, has somebody already had this disease and how could that currently affect their current needs? Now switching to also a challenging and changing environment when it comes to PPE. Now, I always start when I talk with our gynecologists and gynecology teams, I just like to start with something that we, we, have no, we know and something that we have some familiarity. And so I, I want to talk about condoms for just a second. And so know that condoms are a point of personal protective equipment. And so these are questions that I pose to us when we're talking about sexual, uh, sexual intercourse and safety, in that in using a condom is using more than one better as having increased layers. What if you're using it over extended periods of time, potentially using a condom for multiple different um, intercourse sessions? Or is it, would it be, improved outcomes if the condom were actually thicker and would it, could it protect someone more or would they actually use it less because it's um, harder, to, uh, harder to put on. A lot of these questions seem very silly but know that, and that many of us I know were around when HIV and the AIDS epidemic sort of ravaged through the late 80s and early 90s and arguably still today 
And so these are questions that were really commonly asked. And so though they may, see, may seem silly now, they're really important questions that we had to address and that we still address to today when we're talking about how to best protect ourselves. And so I use that as a device to transfer to our own personal protective equipment in the time of COVID-19. So we ask the same questions. You know, is using more than one layer better? What if we're using that PPE over extended period of times? Is a different mask type, whether it's a surgical a procedure mask or a fluid resistant surgical mask or an N95 or R95, um, an elastomeric uh, respirator, are, are one of these better than the other? And so what we do know is we know that there are some situations to where some can be more helpful. But what I would urge you to really consider is the mindfulness of what a mask is and that sometimes more isn't better. Similar to when we had our conversations and we talk about the use of condoms and how to protect oneself, sometimes adding makes things worse, especially if we're not utilizing them well or um, as, as to their biggest benefit. Also know that a mask in the mass mask confusion that know that for many people in, uh, including even myself, a mask helps rep is a physical representation of something that is safe. We look at it, we can hold it, we can know, well, this can potentially keep me safe from something. And so where the harder thing is to change our habits and, you, and how we protect ourselves uh, is as much if not important than the actual mask or mask type itself. In this case with an N95 respirator, there are some things that it do, does have an advantage, specifically better for extended use and potentially repeat use in certain scenarios. Surgical mask, it should be really, really highlighted that repetitive use, especially in high fluid environments or high contamination environments, we should be really careful about reutilizing them. And certainly they should not be considered cleanable. The moment you use a solvent on a surgical and a procedural mask, which may not be fluid resistant, you've significantly compromised that mask. Also know that as we use different mask type, that though we are focused on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, we should also be mindful of, are we tracking other diseases or putting ourselves at risk for other conditions that are potentially as common in our patient population? In a current world of any infectious disease, and most especially in a droplet condition like COVID-19, there is no greater good than good hand hygiene. Our ability to clean our hands, our ability to, to be mindful of what we're touching, and our personal habits is one of the hardest things to change, but it is and will give us the most good, including with our laboring patients. I put this in there of, I grew up having allergies, and I don't know if it's a hold up for that, but I cannot stop touching my face. And so there are times where wearing that social, that socialization mask and wearing that very, uh, the, the paper-based mask, that it help, does help remind me to not touch my face. And so there's, uh, there's a lot of good in that. When we talk about eye protection, Something I will recommend, especially in surgical procedures and in labor and delivery, is consideration of shields versus goggles. So if you're in a situation where you're with a patient, um, whether you've made the decision to use um, a, an N95 or use a surgical mask with a vaginal delivery patient or a C-section patient, one thing that I want to highlight is that a shield itself, if you're using extended wear N95s, will protect the mask better than if you're wearing a surgical mask over it. There are potential concerns about wearing a mask over a mask and how does that affect its overall performance. And so if you're looking to get the best protection for your mask themselves, it is an overall shield. So something that should be highly considered in uh, the setting of surgery and or procedures. Goggles do have their place and many of the facilities, including ours, have many goggles, and we are utilizing those most in our in and out of rooms and in and out of checking on patients and starting um, in, the, in the reuse uh, platform. Know that in this, so here's a great example on this slide of two shields that you have to be very mindful and careful of. You'll see several different types in our, that, some that are fully plastic that can be fully cleaned and sterilized uh, using your 
your suggested ways with either the proper wipes or potentially um, hydrogen peroxide vaporization after cleaning off. But if they have a foam or cloth component, be very mindful of having a process by which after any procedure that involves fluid, that you check the shield and make sure it hasn't been contaminated. So when we you have, talk about the translation of PPE and our different in our different spaces, think about who are they coming in contact and what we know about those patients. As we discuss the different facilities and the screenings, um, I want to let you know that so currently we are we are using in 95s at our facility for known PUIs and COVID positive patients. As we move into testing and the sort of the mindfulness of a asymptomatic patient, we are utilizing masks um, for, um, for our general interactions with patients as a suggestion. I do wanna get into a potentially controversial term of talking about laboring, especially second trimester or second stage of laboring and whether that is an aerosolizing procedure. <clears throat> now know that we don't have great evidence that it is. Um, it is true that people are breathing very heavily, but when we're talking about droplet procedures and droplet precautions, know that from the initial studies on this, look, we're looking at studies of coughing and sneezing. And so in comparison, we're looking at um, how does labor and, deliver, how labor and delivery actions, how do they compare to these original track studies on coughing and sneezing, is there more expectorant? And some of that may be a part of, the, of how close and how interactive you are with someone. I do think having shielding for, and we're using shielding for um, certainly providers and those patients who are directly up um, close with patients who are laboring. Currently our facility is not using N95s with all laboring patients. We are, so we are focusing on the PUIs and COVID positive. It is very possible that we may change that as we find our current prevalence within our asymptomatic. Know that it is a discussion and there are ladders on how we use these, uh, these masks and some of this will be, will be dictated by what your current supply is. There was an interesting study that was done that looked at the actual aerosolization of patients who do have COVID positive. It's a very small study, but they did air sampling. When they asked patients to cough vigorously, breathe heavily, and they did air sampling, they found that there actually wasn't a disease in that, uh, that could be uh, recultured to, uh, to be found in that sampling. But there are other studies, one notable that comes out of that came out of China that found it in sort of the host in the hospital air itself. And so you will need to look at your supplies and what patients you're taking in. And as we learn the prevalence of the disease, use that, utilize that knowledge in your supply to make decisions on how do we best protect ourselves and how do we also protect patients from us, knowing that we are also coming in and out of potentially um, high risk scenarios. Um, let's go back and talk about C-sections for a moment. So one of the most important things to also consider is how you're handling emergent um, surgery, specifically those on labor and delivery that may need intubation. Currently, we're using, um, uh, we're using what we call ACE or N95s for this procedure um, to, for, because of the concern of intubation. I uh, know that in our surgical spaces, we have gone to when things are um, scheduled that intubation occurs and then after a, a period of time, the rest of the team comes in with regular surgical masks and eye, and eye protection. Um, on labor and delivery, because we don't have the liberty of waiting uh, for significant amounts of time because of concern for more with neonatology and work with our, within our team of how of, that we need to react quickly when a patient is being intubated because it may affect the, um, the neonate themselves is that we've also gone through and we've talked about each member of the team and what best and most protects them as well as is mindful with our resources. And so what the team inside the room, it may not be the team, uh, something that somebody who is outside the room needs. As an example of this, we have the benefit of the space of being able to set up our neonatal team next door to our operating room. And so as we deliver the baby, the baby is transferred from one space to another. And so there is a separate team that is then handling in another space, the baby. 
Now that is complex and you have to practice it and for which we have done multiple simulations on how we practice this, um, how we practice this um, exchange. In two of our facilities, we don't have that space. And so then it's making sure that you have the room and there is a well orchestrated dance between the pediatric teams, anesthesia teams, nursing teams, and surgical providers that, that you, that everyone knows where they're going to be and what they're wearing going in and out. Specifically for us, we actually have bags that are in, um, on way to the OR that have backup everything that we would need. And so these bit, these backpacks can actually be popped open and just if somebody has not shown up and they don't have their N95 for a patient that's being going to be intubated or an emergent delivery, we have all of that gear there. An incredibly important person that we have found is a doorkeeper and a traffic monitor because we all run towards the fire. And so there's lots of help when we call our emergency obstetric code. And so it has been found very important for us that we have somebody at the door to help manage who comes in and out and making sure that the patient, that the people who would be coming in and out know exactly what the scenario is for the room um, in any urgent delivery. I talked a little bit about their general, uh, aerosolizing or aerosol generating procedures. Um, intubation, of course, we do know is one. <clears throat> Another may be, you may have facilities, we have one of our three facilities that uses nitrous for as an analgesia or anesthesia for patients. We have, we have discontinued the use of nitrous there is, there is a potential concern of this aerosolization, though there is no, no studies being done on this at the moment. Um, we have also stopped because of concern for the amount of nitrous within the room itself, especially for anyone who may be ill and or patients that may have respiratory illnesses, especially those who are potentially asymptomatic with COVID positive. So at the moment, it's re recommended, I mean, recommended by the anesthesia groups that we stop, our, uh, stop the use of um, self-patient administrated. This is patient-administrated nitrous. Oxygen is also worth discussing. For many, many years, including uh, mine, we have used oxygen as part of a, as a, part of a uh, revitalization um, for um, our uh, patients who are having uh, strips or fetal strips that are of concern. Know that there's actually new data that says that giving oxygen to patients may actually not be helpful in the loss in the sense of it may not change the outcome. But there are still some societies, certainly A1 still recommends the use of oxygen as part of a, a overall fetal resuscitation. <clears throat> so if you're going to be using it, then consider how you're utilizing it. Um, there's, so knowing that nasal cannula probably isn't transferring enough, high flow nasal cannula has been considered an aerosolizing event. There are some ICUs that are using high flow nasal cannulas to deliver oxygen to patients to help decrease the need for ventilation. However, those generally should only be used on and or in the ICU setting, specifically in a, in a unit that has a cohort of patients so that all people and all uh, uh, providers going in and out of the room are appropriately and consistently using the proper PPE. So if you're going to use oxygen, consider using a regular mask. There is some concern that was raised about a non-rebreather. Again, there is no data that talks about specifically if there is or how much aerosolization there would be with non-rebreathers. But we have chosen that if oxygen is going to be used, that we're using a regular mask and non-rebreather at this time. There is no information or data on this. But I do want to highlight that there is information that potentially giving oxygen may not um, actually change outcomes and likely doesn't. The delivery method has kind of things we just discussed and being mindful that overall, when we talk about care, when we talk about the beginning of patient's admission, if they're in antepartum, one of the things that we have also done is we have followed current recommendations. We have had the ability to institute a significant telemedicine um, that we instituted in just a matter of weeks and huge kudos to many who led that effort. So we have decreased the number of physical visits that we have. Overall, the number of uh, patients uh, that have blood pressure cups, which we're using as one of our uh, temperature uh, for being able to do telemedicine, not all of them are required to have it, but it has been helpful. Blood pressure cuffs versus, uh, rather Dopplers versus fetal movement. And know that this is, uh, 
may bring people angst, but the Doppler itself is really checking for, is an assessment for the intrauterine fetal death. And so we are making sure that talk, counseling our patients on proper fetal and on fetal movement monitoring for our patients who don't have, or we're not requiring, we are not requiring rather, Dopplers for our telehealth platforms. <laughs> Steroids for fetal, for fetal lung for maturity as well as for other benefits. We are, we are using um, judiciously in the sense of anyone under 32 weeks, um, potentially 34 weeks, we are, for any COVID positive patient, considering the, uh, the giving those patients um, steroids. This is done in kind of concert with our infectious disease doctors, as well as um, our uh, intensive care doctors. Know that there was information previously in uh, SARS that steroids, when they were given, it increased the viral load and then increased the concern of problematic disease later on for those patients. That has not been seen as of yet in our current COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2, but it is important to mention that steroids can be used. You just need to be need to be done in concert with your pulmonary, your pulmonary and ID doctors. If it is over 34 weeks, then it, you should really consider the risk benefits of whether it is worth giving steroids. Anticoagulation is also incredibly important to consider. There has been found that patients with COVID-19, especially the, with those that we know that are um, symptomatic and admitted, that they should be considered for anticoagulative therapy. As always with anticoagulation, you should be consider when could the potential be delivery occur and how does anticoagulation go in the overall risk benefit picture for each patient. But certainly an anticoagulation policy and or procedure should be discussed. And so that is on topic for a discussion within your OB, MFM, and your anesthesia and other groups that are taking care of any COVID positive patient. One of the new challenges that we are going to be facing and still discussing is for patients that we are testing and or those who are outpatient um, at home. Uh, at the moment, we are not currently treating those patients, but we have started the discussion at looking at with our hematologist whether that is something we should consider, and we don't have a, a current decision on that. We are treating those who are in, inpatient with it, and we are sending patients home postpartum on anticoagulation therapy who were COVID positive. <clears throat> From an intrapartum uh, management, we've already talked about cohorting. Fluids should be considered. This is a great time to consider how many fluids you currently use. We did this a few years ago, and we're actually shocked to realize how much fluid we give somebody, the average patient, especially those receiving epidurals, and improving our timing to make sure that we don't have a patient receiving multiple boluses to get potential epidurals, to get neuroaxial and, uh, anesthesia, as well as how much fluid do you use with giving um, uterotonics like Pitocin, and then what are your fluid habits after someone is delivered? And so go through and look, because COVID patients, it has been found, in, at least in ICU and critical care and emergency room measures, that they do become fluid overloaded more quickly. Magnesium also, because it's a pulm it can affect pulmonary, should be used similar to steroids in concert with your the discussion and the overall care of a patient, especially those who are symptomatic. Currently, our hospital has taken azithromycin out of the um, algorithm for treating or co specifically COVID positive patients. But because we have so many people who are presenting who have an appearance of community acquired pneumonia, azithromycin supply in your space may be limited. And so, along with knowing um, people like your lab director, you should speak to your pharmacy about what are your current supplies of azithromycin because it may change your protocols and how you're handling patients with. Um, premature um, pre-labor rupture of membranes if somebody is in early gestation and staying with you. Our supplies have returned to normal, but for a short time we did make the recommendation of switching to erythromycin over azithromycin, and then also considering the use of azithromycin in the, those who are coming off the floor for, um, for a C-section as well for their prophylaxis of endometritis. More than anything else, I do want to emphasize communication amongst team members, especially our nursing and anesthesia. Anyone who is COVID positive or PUI, if I'm worried about them, I need everybody who knows to know that I'm worried about them. 
nursing to know to make sure we've got all the things for if we were to activate urgent delivery. Same with anesthesia, so that they, they are aware, they know that they can check our epidurals if there is one in place, consider the use of an epidural to help decrease the need for intubation if there is a concern for our emergent delivery. <clears throat> Postpartum, we are currently co-rooming. I know that the AAP guidelines and CDC recommend potential uh, difference, differences, and you have to decide this at your uh, facility on how you do this, how you educate patients, and how you're giving options counseling to patients as well, as well as we've talked a little bit about breastfeeding, and also how you will do your follow-up, and if someone is COVID positive, how quickly you will follow up with that patient. We've talked uh, some about some of this, but mainly is I bring ICU care to talk about that if you're gonna be doing a delivery offsite, if you're gonna be in ICU, if you're gonna be in a med surge floor where, other, where uh, patients are being potentially cohorted that might be pregnant, what is your protocol and how do you get equipment and the staff there the quickest? or the most efficient at least, and so that you've got everything you need. And so if you don't already have a cart or some kit that helps you do deliveries in another, another space in your facilities, certainly now is the time to pull it, pull it together. Uh, to you have that, um, in, that you have all the gear that you have to go on a roll. This is another thing that even a walkthrough simulation that you use nothing, that every part of the team walks through, is incredibly important to know how you get to and from a place with everyone and everything you need efficient. <clears throat> Overall, the goal of my talk today is to create and place in your mind what do you need to create a plan, and not just a plan for today, but how do you anticipate what's going to happen next? Every time somebody mentions a potential you could do this lab test that comes back this quickly, and these are what the results that we may have, when you find out that uh, your labor that your labor and delivery may be soon filled with patients that are being tested or COVID positive how to react and how do you react, how do you create a plan? And so as an example, if, uh, if we're doing testing for asymptomatic patients, is there a near future where we will be testing patients before they come into the hospital? We're already doing that with some of our, sur our surgical patients. And so if that is true and you know somebody uh, that is going to be testing positive before they come in, how are you doing, are you doing delayed procedures? Are you also delaying or um, how you're reacting to deliveries or inductions. If not, how and where do these patients go when they have test positives from now, the outside? Communication, it will be key to how you rally your team together, how you pull things to make sure that both your patients and our healthcare workers are all kept safe, to make sure we decrease fear, decrease confusion, and we create a specific plan that takes an overarching idea and makes it neat for your procedure in your space. Thank you very much for your time. There's been lots of uh, discussion, lots of different uh, things that will still change, expect that change, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Um, so we do have just a couple minutes left, so I will try to get through these next little housekeeping slides fairly quickly. Uh, so again, we will be posting this uh, webinar on our website. I put it in the chat function, the link for the um, page that we'll be on. They're usually up within about 24 hours. These slides will accompany it as well. Um, also within these slides, Dr. Horton just kind of um, slid past it, but there is a list of his resources and his references right there that will be in there as well. And then again, if you have any questions, um, please email us at info at needtech.org. And also you can submit a technical assistance request at needtech.org as well. And so first question for Dr. Horton, um, hopefully a fairly easy one is, uh, do you have, can you share any of these protocols at all, like your breastfeeding uh, protocols and such, or, or are they already available somewhere? Almost all ours are very readily available. I mean, I, I mentioned several, ACOG, A1, there's good, good ones from AJOG and now FIGO. The main thing is that look at, and because I'm happy to I'll share ours, but it's not going to necessarily apply to your specific space. My biggest suggestion is take one of these national or international guidelines, get a small group of you together and walk it through your space and ask the 
what if this and what if that that's gonna and have somebody there as a documenter to write down how you do this and so um i'll make sure I, i'll get hopefully clearance to be able to show you like our protocols but i think if you read them you're going to find them fairly generic as well and so the question is how do you apply it to your space your people Thank you. And then, yes, as a note, we do try to, uh, sh we shared these protocols as well from our institutions at neettech.org at our resource repository when we do have them. Uh, second question is, are you having patients in their, in their patient room wear a procedure mask in the, in the context of universal masking? Great question. At the moment, we, um, we are having them uh, not, we are currently masking um, patients that are potentially coming in that are PUI and COVID positive. We are right now talking about that conversion to wearing patients masks, but I'll let you know at the moment, they're not. We are, we are as providers masked, but our patients are not. And so, they, but I will freely admit, I, I think it is very likely that will change come even next week. And then I think I'll probably try to combine two questions into one is, uh, so many are considering all patients PUIs. How mm -hmm. are you managing C-sections for PUIs or known positives? And are you um, doing C-sections in negative pressure ORs if so? Great question. Um, we don't have negative pressure ORs in labor and delivery. There are a couple on the main floor that are negative pressure. Those are being utilized by surgery. They are intubating those patients and taking them to a different surgical space for the operative procedures. For us, what we are doing is any emergent procedures, we're going in wearing as if a patient will be or could be intubated. For non-emergent procedures, our anesthesia teams are all, all wearing 95s as part of, we call it ACE. Um, but full protective gear. And then when we, the, because we have the benefit in a scheduled procedure of knowing that we have a good, a well-working epidural, the rest of the team at that point is wearing di uh, what we call dice or the uh, surgical mask plus face mask. There always comes up the initial like, immediate response of that any patient could be intubated and that is true. But at the moment, we are, we are utilizing our anesthesia team, we'll place the epidural, we test the epidural. If the epidural um, um, is, appears to be working well, then our teams are using regular, regular surgical masks with full face shield protection. Thank you. And for my nursing friends on the webinar, um, do you have any suggestions for nurses supporting patients during epidural placement during labor to reduce exposure, like alternative positioning? Absolutely, great and great question. What I would say is creating the expectation when the patient comes to the room, and so you do a lot of, if you, yeah, we have found if you do some of the pushing and or the preparation ahead of time, that you'll find yourself interacting less closely in someone's kind of face um, when it comes time for pushing. One of the things that like utilizing, if you've got bars, to, uh, bars for the patient to be able to hold that, to be able to hold and pull, um, really coaching patients on being able to hold legs, reutilizing your bars and your stirrups to help for getting positioning or positioning on the side. Also know that there is lots of pushing that can happen that doesn't have to be in like a classic dorsal lithotomy. And so you can do pushing with patients and this is where you should, we lean on our midwifery count, um, counterparts and expertise to help us learn these pushing techniques that also doesn't necessarily mean we've got a hand behind their neck, a hand behind the leg, and right there in their face kind of pushing. But I do think that overall, just making sure that we have, a, you know, you're, you're wearing your mask, we're doing good eye protection, and that you have great hand hygiene, and that we're very mindful of touching our face after any procedures, and what we interact with will go a tremendous way from protecting, for protecting you. Perfect. And uh, thank you. And last uh, question, because this has been asked a couple times, is are you, um, is it advised that you ask patients to wear a mask while pushing? So <clears throat> there, so when, if it's been advised, the answer is the moment. There's not any like national guideline that it may be there. I haven't read them all, um, but that says that they need to be wearing it. Currently, ours are not. But again, I emphasize that we are even re-looking at that. And so next week they may. And that's why in the very first slide it said, I say that um, you may be in your planning mode because everyone is and know that we're there as well. And so I, I can't give you a, solid, a, a fine, final, this is the best way to do that. 
I can tell you that at the moment, our pushing patients who are non-PUIs, non-COVID patients, positive patients, are not wearing masks with pushing. We are protecting ourselves and, and having good donning and doffing procedures on our side. Well, thank you. Um, we do have a couple more questions left in the queue, but since we have quite a few, uh, we are going to record these and um, get together a Q&A to also post alongside, um, hopefully shortly after this webinar is published. Uh, just a reminder that again, it will be published at that website that I shared in the chat function. And also at that same website tomorrow, since there were so many questions about masks and PPE and some of those procedures, we do have a webinar about specifically masks, and we have uh, some of our nursing leaders at NEETEC, Jill Morgan, Kate Bolter, um, and a couple others who will be presenting on that tomorrow afternoon, I believe it is. Um, so please just go ahead and go to that website, check it out and register for the webinar. Also make sure you stay on at the end of this webinar if you do want your CNE or your, or your CME credits. Again, that uh, website will just pop up with the with the online survey and then the directions for you to obtain your certificate. And then uh, Dr. Horton, if you don't mind advancing to our um, one of the last slides, make sure that you check us out at courses.needtech.org where we have online modules as well with free CNE and free CME mm -hmm. credits. Also our YouTube channel with just in time skill videos. And then um, make sure you follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, LinkedIn, all of our experts um, will drop some of their tips and tricks there from time to time as well and join in the conversation there thank you very much for your time today we appreciate it everyone have a wonderful evening and stay safe out there thank you so much